All right, what's going on, guys? G.Doc Casey here, getting ready to start the stream. Sorry about the little bit of a delay there. My computer crashed like 10 minutes before it was ready to go for stream time, and I had to get everything ready again. So here we go. So this is going to be the first time I've casted some StarCraft in quite a while, uh, specifically for the CTL as well. It's been a long time since I've done that. But this season, I'm hoping to cast every single week for Team Lit. Uh, this season, this is the 18th season in StarCraft 2, or <laughs> not in StarCraft 2, in CTL. Uh, 18 seasons. So this league has been going on for quite a while. And, uh, you know, I I've been involved in it. I started in Season 7 and was sort of in and out. Um, along the way, but season 18, week one, it's going to be Lit versus Team Unrivaled. Uh, we already have a couple things going on here. So set one was a walkover in favor of Unrivaled um, due to a time time issue, or I guess uh, our player wasn't able to show up on time. Um, and then sets two and three were automatic buys for or automatic wins basically for Lit because UR couldn't field any players in those slots. So we are starting off, uh, Lit is starting off with a 2-1 to one lead, uh, moving into set 4, which is going to start things off today with Strix versus Fireclaw. So let's go ahead and load up that replay here and get right into it. It's been a little while since I've done this, so you guys are going to have to bear with me. Um, if any te technical difficulties come up here, I'll try to fix them as quickly as possible. StarCraft 2 was being a little weird uh, when I came into it basically taking like 10 seconds to load up the option screen and stuff like that when I was trying to make things work and it was a little weird so I'm hoping it's going to work. Alright, so kicking things off here on Neon Violet Square up in the top left corner representing Team UR, it is Fireclaw. And in the bottom right corner representing Lit, the Zerg, it is Strix. Kicking things off with a ZVP here. And it's going to be on Neon Violet Square, which is a map that has been around for a little while, at least one season. Um, I've kind of been outside the scene here, but I know that this map has been around. So it's something that these players are going to be pretty familiar with. <clears throat> but as far as the actual metagame goes, I mean, I've been out of the scene for a little while. So this is me learning the metagame. Uh, as well as casting at the same time here. But we do have gateways going down on the low ground here. So obviously we'll be expecting the Protoss player to drop an expansion somewhat soon. That is already down here for the Zerg player, which has been scouted by Fireclaw. <clears throat> Not really sure the, uh, you know, the popular openings. I know that Protoss likes to go Stargate. Uh, I know that Zerg likes to make Zerglings early on. I'm really just excited to see how these games open up and getting back into the meta. Gas going down, spawning pool of four Strix up here. We are still waiting. It's going to be a Nexus into a Cybercore, most likely. I know as Protoss, a lot of them like to make like a bunch of gateways and throw out a bunch of adepts early on so that'll be interesting to see if Fireclaw goes that route or maybe he'll go for the stargate and try to go for you know a late game macro play really no signs of anything just yet spawning pool is going to finish and this is the first sort of instance where we're going to get an idea of what's going on here the third base going down and it looks like the drones are sticking in gas for at least a little bit well they got to get that hundred gas anyway Hey, what's up, Strix? So he's going to get that 100 gas, most likely get Ling speed. And then uh, at this moment, he is staying in gas. So it seems as though he may have plans for using that gas somewhere else. Maybe Banelings, maybe Roaches. There's that Ling speed. Meanwhile, on the Protoss side, the natural base is finishing up here relatively soon. And we do have a Stargate, so we'll probably be seeing an Oracle. There's an Adept leading its way out onto the map as well. Gonna try to get a little bit of scouting. These lanes are in an odd position. A 
Overlord Speed coming in as well. This Adept is going to come down here and actually might have a chance to kill a drone or at least force them off the mineral line here. There's literally no defense here at all. Well, two Lings are coming back, but they're not really going to get too much done. Cancels the Shade. Sees the Lings coming in. Drones are heading back down here. But that was a, you know, a pretty significant early on in a game to force that many drones off the line for so long. And this Adept is still here. And has a chance to get even more kills. There's really nothing here to kill this. Three more drones coming out. Another Adept showing up. Two Queens on the way. The Roachmorn going down. But this uh, Mineral Line has been under siege for much longer than is, is normal here. And now drones are starting to go down. These Adepts are <laughs> really getting a lot done. Now the third base is up here. So the... Uh, Drones have somewhere to run for now as these adepts come into the main and try to pick off a few more drones here. Trying to target fire the drones down. How many uh, worker kills do we have so far? Ten worker kills so far. And bear with me here as I lower the uh, sound just a little bit. Finding that just a bit too loud. Let me know, guys, if the volume is off. Finally, the adepts are going to get cleaned up. But as a, after a total of 11 workers go down, that's quite a bit. Oracle coming out now. Strix is going to have to be able to deal with that. We also have three gateways and a Phoenix follow-up as well as two forges. With two forges coming down, um, I wouldn't be surprised to see a third base coming out at some point from Fireclaw. As the Lynx head out, the Oracle is coming in. There's a queen in place, and one queen is usually all right against this but you can still get at least a couple drone kills gonna come over here and pick off a third one maybe a fourth yep he's gonna get four he's losing a lot of drones here on the other side the lings are uh waiting for a command that oracle did end up going down though so small victory here for strix as the lings are gonna poke up one zealot gonna be walling this off fairly well but he could attack like the gateway or a pylon or something if he wanted to Still no third base in sight for our Protoss player, but he is getting upgrades and he's starting to make Phoenix over here. He's up to four gateways as well, and we're going to be waiting on him to see which way he wants to go with this game. As for the Zerg player, getting Lair about halfway done. Uh, one Evo Chamber, getting those gases and trying to catch up, basically. The worker count is heavily in favor of Fireclaw. Ah, you are right, sir. I should actually, uh, hold on. This was one, this was two. There we go. As it stands right now, this is set four, and Lit has a 2-1 lead. But all of those points were scored because of walkovers. This Overlord's gonna get shoot away here. The Lings are here. Gonna be able to spot this third base at some point. Our forces are under attack. Not quite seeing anything about it right now. But should be able to scout that off here. But there's a lot of zealots in place as well as a sentry to be able to defend. This is definitely not going to be enough links. A few more links coming across here. Going to try to get eyes on some things. But again, not really going to get much done here. Bailing nest is done. The lair is completed as well. Got to get some more drones in these gases though. Because as of now... Still doesn't have a lot of gas to spend. These lings do finally spot the third. A few of them going to get trapped, maybe? No, they're going to be able to get out mostly with their lives. There are a ton of zealots here, so roaches are not an awful idea. Zealot charge is done, though. So this is going to be a very powerful zealot army for Fireclaw. And with his drone lead, like, he's... He's really in a pretty good spot. Or with his worker lead, I apologize. Plus one attack for Lings coming out. But still only 29 workers here for Strix. So he's basically going all in at this point. I mean, there's really no coming back from this. All uh, Fireclaw has to do is defend. And he's got quite a lot of units here with decent upgrades. These overlords have been rallied over here for a long time. I'm not actually sure how many of these have gone down so far. I know at least one. That's going to be a second one going down. Fairly soon, and the zealots are moving up. These, this is definitely not enough links. The roach count is relatively high, so 
So there's a, a chance that maybe some damage could get done, but it looks like he wants to make some banelings as well. Is there roach speed? There is no roach speed. Lair is complete, by the way, so roach speed is uh, an option for our Zerg player, but going without it for now. So these slow roaches out on the map here are going to have a rough time picking and choosing their engagements how they want. More overlords over here just getting picked off. They have overlord speed too, so they could have probably ran away at some point, but... Instead, just making more lings and more overlords. And the Protoss player is just sort of gearing up for a defense, basically. He's moving into high Templars now as well. So basically a charge lot Archon composition here coming out of Fire Cloud, which is a very, very strong composition against a lot of things that Zerg can do. It's pretty hard to uh, defend against this type of attack. But it's even harder when you're attacking into it, which it looks like Strix is about to do here. Banelings are getting some decent connections. Force fields go down. And a lot of those Zealots died, actually. Those Banelings got some pretty good hits. And there's a large number of links here. So this attack is a little more scary than I initially anticipated. But Archons are so good against links, especially if they can back up into a choke like this. Some corrosive bile going down a little bit. A bunch more Zealots warping in, though. And with charge, it's just going to be too much here for Strix. And he's going to have to back off. Now, I mean, the Protoss player has been on full three base saturation here for quite a while. Going to be thinking about a fourth base soon. But in the whole game, there hasn't been any drones over here at the third for Strix. So the longer and longer and longer this goes on, the farther and farther behind he's going to fall. And eventually it's going to lead to just one big gigantic Protoss ball hitting you in the face. And there's nothing you can really do about it. That is my prediction for this game. But we're going to have to see here. It's not over yet. It's always possible that the Protoss player could make a mistake. But one of the good things about the Charge Lot Archon composition is that it's pretty hard to make mistakes with it because it's very powerful just like automatically. You don't even really have to do much. The sentries are going to help with some force fields to shape the battlefield the way he wants. So it's going to be tough here. Fireclaw is moving out. The Zealots leading the charge here. The Zerg army hiding on the left. And they're basically crossing ships in the night here. There's some overlords out here that are going to get vision on this army. And then going to die to the Archons probably. Or not. But Strix does have vision here. So it looks like he's going to respond. Going to try to catch this army out in the open. But now Fireclaw's got the high ground with a warp prism for support. So in a weird way, even though Fireclaw is attacking, he's going to have the better position up here on the high ground defending against Strix. At least that's how I see this going. Looks like he's going to be moving in now, attacking into the natural, or into the third base, sorry. And Strix is going to try to be setting up this flank. But the thing is, in order for a flank to work, you need to have enough presence on both sides of, of the flank. And in this case, the south side just had no presence. Gets mopped up incredibly quickly. Force fields are going to zone Strix out here. And it's just not looking too good for our Zerg player in this game. The War Prism just needs to dodge Corrosive Vials. Here comes another gigantic warp in. And he's basically bullying Strix out of his own third base position. And he comes into the natural now. There's pretty much nothing here that's going to be able to stop this Protoss army. The Roaches are going to try to micro back here, but the drones are going down in the natural. There's one Ravager out here with a Roach. And that's basically all she wrote. GG. Good game for Fireclaw, getting a victory there, and tying the score up at two apiece. So, let's come over here. I'm trying to update these live as we go, so each round is going to have a slight break here while I do that. There we go. All right. <clears throat> so after set four, which was the first game that we casted today, we're looking at a 2-2 score already, moving into set number five. This one's going to be on Blackwater. And we're going to load this in.
All right, here we go. So this is a diamond matchup on Blackwater. Let's go ahead and introduce the teal Zerg player in the bottom right corner of the map, representing Lit. It is Sniper SC. And in the top left corner, representing Team Unrivaled, the purple Terran player, SCV user. Looking at a ZBT now on Blackwater. This map is something I am very unfamiliar with. On first glance, it looks all right. It looks relatively standard, I think. There's a little bit of a weird thing going on over here. There's some weird sound effects going on, like I'm in a jungle or something. But other than that, it's pretty cool. ZVT is a matchup that I've, as a Zerg player myself, have just been kind of confused with. Like, it just seems like everybody wants to go Ling Hydra Bane in the mid game and try to get an advantage somehow, kill a third base or defend uh, all the different attacks that Terran could throw at you. So again, being as though I've been away from the scene for so long and trying to sort of come back into it and, and learn here, I'm really happy to be able to cast these games and see what other people are doing at every level. And then I can try to incorporate some of this stuff into my own game. SCV user does go across the map with a SCV. And he scouts the natural. Did he actually see the pool go down? I think he did not. Nope. But he did see the gas. So he's probably already expecting the pool. And on his side of the map, Barracks is done. Reaper's coming out. He's only got one gas, so not really going too crazy here with the tech or the uh, early aggression. But the Reaper's going to come out and get a little bit more scouting. Second base is down as well. And here we go. Early game as usual. Probably going to see a couple queens come out here. Some Ling speed. It's all timed out pretty well here for Sniper SC. Factory going down. Marines to follow up. The Marines are pretty good because they're going to be able to shoo away any overlords that try to come in. But here comes the Reaper. Going to be able to get a scout. He's going to be looking for a third base. He's going to be looking for like a Roach Warren or anything weird like that. A big pool of Lings. He does see that the spawning pool is researching speed. He's wreaking a little bit of havoc here. He does get a kill. He's going to back on out here. Six lings and two queens is usually all you really need to push away one reaper. But the reaper provides like consistent scouting for the Terran player. This is pretty interesting. Is he actually hiding in the grass? Can he be seen in there? I don't really know. I feel like he should be, but interesting little spot. Star 4 coming through. All basic stuff. It's just like a 1 1 1 opening with a second base here for SCV user. He is swapping over the factory onto the reactor, so we're going to be seeing Hellions coming out. Also, pretty standard in most cases. Reaper coming back in. Going to try to get a second look. Still no third base. Oh, he's got the SCV over here. Uh, I didn't even notice that. So that SCV is scouting for the third base. Knows that it hasn't been dropped that way. And the Reaper can just come check here whenever he really wants. So we got two Evo Chambers and a Baneling Nest coming down. This is before a Lair, before a third base. Seems like he's trying to be pretty aggressive, but that's a lot of gas here for two upgrades and Banelings. Have to see how that works out. Reaper's going to back off here. SEV's still looking for that third. It's a pretty long time to go without a third here, so that should be ringing alarm bells for SEV user. You should be understanding that you know, the bunker's here. He might need to be extra defensive here in the, in the near future. Where are these Hellions? I'm having a real hard time spotting the purple on this mini-map here. Just colorblind issues. Everyone's picking purple and I'm having issues seeing purple on the mini-map. But here come the four Hellions. Going to try to get another look. They see no third base here. So at this point, SCV user knows that unless Sniper SC is taking a, like a weird hidden third base, then... He's going to be facing some aggression here. So we're going to be seeing some defensive moves by him on this side. He's getting a couple extra barracks, some Widow Mines filling up that bunker. 
and using the Hellions to basically get map control and see when this attack is coming out. You can see a lot of links pulling up here now, and these Hellions are going to be able to pick off quite a few of them. So, I mean, it, it seems like we're going to have like a 1-1 Banelink bus or something here, which I'm intrigued, and I, I'm interested in the idea of it, but it just strikes me as something that's going to hit way too late. And especially with the scouting that SDV users have been doing. Finally, third base going down for Sniper SC. This might be being used for just extra production for Lings. Uh, for his attack. But 1-1 one is going to be finished soon, so I imagine he's going to try to try to move out here. See, the weird thing, though, is now he's making drones. So it was sort of like a 1-1 one -one Zergling defense but there was no attack coming so now he's getting his third base and he's making drones he's making queens it looks like he's planning on trying to macro out of it but on the other side of the map scv users moving across he's got a bunch of widow mines here small amount of marines he doesn't really need to attack into this i think granted he doesn't have a third base himself so he's been uh prepping for a big two base attack i guess and in this case this might actually work a little bit for sniper sc as he's got 1-1 one, one Lings now. He has the capability for Banelings, but he doesn't have any morphed yet. In comes the attack. <laughs> Huge Widowmine shots. All the Zerglings die. That is incredible. Now the Hellions and Stims and Marines moving in. GG, says Sniper. And that's going to do it. That was a... A bit of an odd one there from uh, Sniper, I think. Where, like, the, the build he was going for just seemed... It seemed like he was prepping for some sort of attack with it, but then he just sort of defended with it. But then instead of getting anything real, really done with the defense, all the links just died to Widow Mines, and then the game was over. So, I don't know. A little bit of a rough shot there for a Sniper SC. He said he had some pretty bad ping during that, so sounds unfortunate. But that is actually going to give the lead... Oh, sorry, one sec here. I'm going to give the lead over to UR. So that is another red mark for us in this uh, in this uh, CTL week. <coughs> so as it stands right now, it's three to two for Unrivaled. One more win for them, and they're actually going to take the week, um, and the rest is just gravy. But let's go ahead and jump into set number six here. Which is going to take place on Catalyst. And this is match point for Unrival. If they win this, they win the week. So it's a pretty big game. If you're pulling for Lit, you're pulling for Kia pretty heavily here as we got another Diamond match coming up on Catalyst. Let's go ahead and introduce the players. In the bottom right, representing you are a Green Zerg for once. It is Sangju. And in the top left, the purple Protoss representing Lit. Everything hangs on his shoulders at this moment. Although he probably didn't know that at the time. It is Kia. That's how I'm going to say the name for now. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing any names. If I do, let me know and I'll do my best to fix it. ZVP on Catalyst. This is a map that I actually vetoed a lot when I played Zerg, but I don't know if that was actually pretty smart. Might have been a dumb move. Because, uh, I think Zergs like this map, don't they? I don't know. I guess we're going to have to find out. Let's fix the, fix the score here. There we go. This is all stuff that's just going to come more naturally, naturally to me as I get back into casting every week. So, little hiccups here and there. I apologize for. Once again, gateway on the low ground. It's pretty much always the case these days, isn't it? And double gas here. Double gas opening for the Protoss player. Indicates some sort of early tech. I guess we'll have to wait and see. I'm not exactly sure what the Protoss guys are doing these days with early gas like that. Probe's going to come in. Going to scout the pool. Going to scout the gas. Everything super standard here. On the Zerg side of things. Hmm. Interesting. Cybercore going down before the uh, Nexus. 
Is that like a Stargate? Seems like a Stargate. I guess we'll have to wait and see. Probe's just sitting here, just watching. Sees the pool complete, heads on down. Maybe go look for a third base somewhere. I'm interested to see what we see being built here from Kia once the Cybercore is done. He's going right into that warp gate and chrono boosting it out. Oh, can we see some like adepts? I'd love to see some adepts here coming out of Kia today. We did actually see some adepts do some intense damage, but it wasn't even like an actual adept attack. It was literally just like a, an adept opener that ended up turning into like this incredibly successful harass we do got the third base going down for saying on the other side of the map here the zerg player just keeping things super standard he did pull out of gas so he's getting just enough for speed and then keeping one in there so he can you know get a baneling nest at some point or maybe some overlord speed essentially just not have nothing Ling's going up here see one adept and a zealot and they might have seen the three gateways that's a pretty big tell the cyber core or with the uh, twilight council going down in the background here i'm pretty sure we're going to be seeing a number of adepts in this game coming out of kia i hope we do because i like adepts they're pretty fun thank you coming back home with his lings meanwhile just making a lot of drones he's got a pretty big drone lead right now he's going to try to increase that exponentially and keep going with it the roach horn coming down very good idea if he success if he uh, suspects any type of attack, and now he's going to. Nice cancel there by uh, Kia. The Overlord is scouting the Twilight Council and the Gateway. And this is enough to suspect something here with the Twilight Council that early. Although he's not researching out of it. I think he's doing that deliberately. There's a Dark Shrine. Where is this? It's over here? Wait, where's the Dark Shrine? Oh, it's right in front of my face. My bad. So the Dark Shrine is actually spotted. No, it's not. Okay, look at that. Great play by Kia here, dropping down the Dark Shrine as the Overlord gets out of range. Now, it's still something that he could expect, seeing the Twilight Council in the first place, but nice sneaky mind games there. Canceling whatever that was uh, initially. I didn't actually see what was canceled. Um, and then dropping down a Dark Shrine as soon as the Overlord leaves uh leaves sight so this is gonna maybe hit sang chu by surprise here i don't see any pylons on the other side of the map though so that's a little bit iffy for kia he's gonna have to wait quite a while to actually land an attack there's no warp prism so sang chu still has time to sort of sniff this out a lot of zergs get uh spore crawlers just for the hell of it anyway but he is in heavy macro mode here. He's only had a handful of links the entire game. He's trying to make as many drones as possible so that he doesn't have to make any more, basically, for the rest of the game. Instant roach speed coming through. Looks like he's going to be relying on roaches for this first attack or first defense. And it will be a defense. The Dark Templars are running across the map here. Again, might have been a little better if there was a pylon hidden somewhere just so that they can be hitting already. But... You know, it's not a perfect world for everybody. So <laughs> he's going to make do with what he's got. And he's splitting them up as well. Going to try to hit different bases here. Or actually, these two are just heading right into the main. And Sang Shu has no idea about this, by the way. His roaches are not in position at all. Here comes another Dark Templar. Now we're going to see Overseers being morphed in. Drones are going down in abundance, though. A queen over here at the third base is going to be going down as well. There's no vision here. For Sang Chu, the Overseer is going to be finished now, and once it is, these Dark Templars are going to be cleaned up relatively easily. And we're going to take a look here and see just how many workers were killed. 17 workers killed and counting. Finally, the last Dark Shrine goes, or the last Dark Templar goes down. And there were some Roaches on the other side of the map here, but they're not going to be getting too much done. Very successful attack as even more Dark Templar end up going down. But 28 workers killed there from Kia. That's the type of damage that you need to do when your Zerg opponent is droning up as massively as he was. And now he's got a worker lead. 
He's also making Sang Shu feel like he needs to get some damage done on the other side of the map. The one thing is there's no third base here for the Protoss yet, so I imagine that's uh, that's not great. Having a third behind this would have been pretty good to fall back on, and it looks like he's thinking about that. As the Roaches are coming in from the right path, the Protoss army heading out through the left path, and there is one Dark Shrine here, but or one Dark Shrine. I always call them Dark Shrines. They're Dark Templar. Uh, going to be picked off because the Overseer is in position. And these Roaches are trying to sneak into the natural. Picking off a pylon that's powering four gateways. Where's the rest of the Protoss army? Coming in here for the third base. We're going to have a little bit of a base trade scenario here, I think. The Protoss army is pretty strong. And it looks like it got recalled back to the main. So he's actually going to be able to push this away. Losing a pylon and a gateway. And leaving a few army a few army units back here to try to take care of this third. But it looks like the roaches are going to be in position to defend that. So, overall, a little bit of a slugfest going on here. Some damage on both sides. And Sang Chu has retaken the worker lead. And I think the big reason for this is that the third base has been delayed for so long. So... The damage was done and it kept Kia in the game for going for a very tech-heavy opening. But without the third base to fall back on, Kia's going to have a little bit of trouble here. It looks like he knows this. I think he wants to get that third. And Sang Shu wants to deny it. As he comes up the ramp here with a handful of roaches, charge lots, charging on in. There's some Dark Templar here as well. The Overseer is like in position, I guess, so that's okay. The Archons are dishing out a lot of damage, but there's a lot of roaches here. Who's going to win this? He... Charge lot reinforcements are very strong, and now that answer is pretty clear as eventually the Protoss army is going to end up pushing away these roaches. And finally, he might feel comfortable to take a third base. More roaches coming out behind this, by the way, from Sang Chu. He did drone up a little bit and managed to, uh, again, extend his worker lead a little bit more. He's got 51, not really where he wants to be, but it's been a scrappy game, so it's not terrible. He's still ahead of his opponent. And this Overlord over the third is going to be able to spot that third base going down uh, you know, whenever it does. So, he's essentially in a bit of a better spot at this point. Almost decided to engage his Protoss army. Instead, he's going to try to make it back to his third base. I think he's going to get there as well. This army is pretty strong, but with the amount of production that Sang Chu's got now with his economy lead, uh, he's going to be able to pump up enough roaches to be able to defend this. And actually, it looks like Kia is going to be turning around here, maybe understanding that. Still no third base. I mean, the main is almost entirely mined out already. So there's a timer on this. Oh, and Sang Chu drops the creep at the third at the very last moment. That is a tricky play here, and that's going to delay the third even more. I imagine Kia has got to be incredibly frustrated about this, being almost 10 minutes into the game without a third, and you haven't uh, killed your opponent's third yet pretty bad but Sang Chu here maybe overstepping his boundaries a little bit he doesn't really need to be doing this um, containing is fine he doesn't have to go up there and lose his whole army and it looks like he's not going to do that just yet but this uh, overlord does need to be taken care of by something <clears throat> the warp gates are starting to kick in for Kia though upgrades are coming through now 1-1 one, one already done for the ground army, or the melee unit, sorry, of uh, Sang Chu. And it looks like, again, he's trying to get ready for an attack here. And it just doesn't seem like a good idea. There are so many Archons here. He's actually committing to this attack. Corrosive Vile's landing a little bit, and the, all Roaches are attacking these Archons. But the Archons are very strong, and they're going to be able to defend this uh, somewhat easily. I mean, he lost a lot of Zealots, but overall... I don't like the decision to go in with that attack here for Sang Chu, and that's going to give Kia a little bit of momentum here. He he smells blood. He's moving across the map trying to take advantage of uh, this slip up by Sang Chu. But we got 18 Roaches in production now, plus one attack. Did it just finish? Yeah, it did. Okay. Plus one missiles just finished for the Zerg army as well. So, I mean, with the economy that Sang Chu has, he, he can afford this, and he has enough production to pump out 18 roaches at once to be able to answer to this attack and now he's setting up a very interesting flank here this is not going to go well for kia these these archons are doomed he's going to have to recall again if that's even an option here but it looks like no all the protoss units are going down here very nice 
defensive positioning from Sang Chu. Uh, and very nice uh, ma early game macro to be able to put himself in a position to make this many roaches at once. And look at this. Still no third base here from Kia. I mean, his natural is going to start mining out here soon. He's going to have no money, and the supply count shows it. As he finally takes care of these uh, this overlord. But more roaches now are moving across the map. They're going to deny this third base. And I think at this point here, Kia's got to be feeling pretty drained with this game. Not being able to get a third for so long and just sort of not being able to get a leg up. The, do the Dark Templar attack early on and the mind games that he did early in the game. Thank you, Solid, for that follow. I appreciate that. The um, early game attack did a ton of damage but there was no third base follow-up is what i think happened here now the roaches are coming in here they're gonna bully uh kia out of his natural these gateways are doomed and uh things are not looking good there are some high templar up here does he even have storm though no he does not so they're gonna have to morph into archons and it's just not gonna be enough here the natural is going down on the other side of the map there are some some dark templar here trying to get counter damage and they've been murdering a shit ton of drones here. 46 drones have gone down so far. And this third base is probably going to die. But the problem is... Wait, where's the Overseer? Sang Chu does not appear to have an Overseer with his main army. So a few Dark Templars could be defending against this. Overseers are all down here. Third base isn't going to go down. I would have liked to see some defensive Dark Templar here for... Kia, and this is a pretty strong army. He might be able to defeat this. Charge lots are very good against roaches that are trying to disengage. But the micro is actually pretty good for Sang Chu here. He may be able to survive this, although these stalkers are going to be up and out for sure. And just as I say that, he ends up getting taken out. The problem is, three base production back here, and this many roaches coming with overseers this time. So, it's not looking good for Kia here as the roach army advances on the natural. He's trying to rebuild that, but here are the roaches, and there goes the Protoss army. GG, well played, and Sanctu is going to take that. And that, my friends, is actually going to be enough to give Team UR the victory for week number one. But we do still have some more games to cast, and cast them we shall. Let's go ahead and do that. <coughs> so, unfortunately, things not going super well for Lit. We've actually lost every single game I've casted. Uh, we got a couple points for the walkovers. Um, and then we gave away a point for a walkover as well. So that's going to be enough points to seal the deal for Team UR for week number one. But we got the ace match here. And this is always going to be... Well, I was going to say it's always going to be the best game. It's That's not necessarily true. But it's going to be the top level players from both teams uh, really representing. And there's a little bit of bragging rights that goes in. Even though UR um, is going to win this week, there's a little bit of pride that we can take if our best player beats their best player. right? And I like that sort of... Uh, dynamic so that said let's jump into it kicking things off on east watch now the ace match is a best of three so we potentially have three more games we could be seeing here as we get into the map here on east watch ladder edition in the top right corner of this map representing team you are They've already won, but they still fight on. It is Teardrop. And the bottom left corner representing Lit. It is the pink Terran player, or teal Terran player. It is Axis. I seriously can't... No, oh, that's teal. Never mind. Some days I feel a little extra colorblind. I don't know why. But anyway, we got a TVT here, which is going to be pretty interesting against each team's best players. I have... It's, it's pink? Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's either pink or teal, but 
I'm, it's now being confirmed that this is pink. I've casted Axis before in uh, Clan Wars a little while ago, and I remember him doing extremely well and having very refined builds, but it has been a little while since I've casted him, so we'll see what's going on. I'm sure he hasn't lost that ability. Going for the double gas opening. And only a single gas over here for tear Teardrop. So that's pretty definitive already. Usually the double gas is uh, going to lead to a varying amount of aggression. There's a lot of different things Terran players can throw at each other. Especially when they both play Terran. The best thing about that is that I doubled down on the teal and I just basically decided it was teal and then just went with it. I like this. These are going to be able to spot those uh, liberators, those dropships, any other type of thing that can happen. Sometimes Terran players will build like a factory so they can just like lift it in and start throwing widow mines in your mineral line. So far, Axe is keeping everything at home. And a very early expansion here for Teardrop. Now, he's keeping his Reaper at home, which is smart. Because if you move your... <laughs> it's whatever color I want it to be. Thank you. Uh, if you move your Reaper across the map, and then somehow, like, the other Reaper comes in, you got nothing to defend. So, I like the decision to keep this here. But he's not going to get any scouting. So, he's not really going to see what's coming here. And there's definitely something coming. Actually, I already got a couple of Reapers out here for Axis. Now, Teardrop did end up getting the second gas eventually, so he is getting gas here. But he's definitely going to have to be on the defensive. And I'm interested to see what type of attack Axis uh, throws at him here. Now, two Reapers, I mean, this is a pretty obvious solution, right? Two Reapers are better than one. So he's going to bully that Reaper back into the main. There's a couple Marines here. One SCV goes down, but the Reapers can just get on out of there. Trying to pick off that single Reaper from Teardrop, but the Cyclone is going to push the Reapers away. That's exactly what you need to defend against Reapers, and that's going to be the end of that, at least for now. Still no expansion coming out of Teal, though, or <laughs> out of Teal over here. Um, so, clearly we're seeing some aggression moving across the map with Cyclones of his own. Now the second base goes down. And see, this is a little bit of an improved version of what Kia was trying to do. That Reaper is dead. The Kia went with the very heavy attack and then just didn't have a, another base to fall back on while he was attacking. Uh, in this case, Axis is going for the heavy attack, but he's going to have a second base to fall back on. So he can potentially cancel this base or make it lift off. And this is what we're going to see happening right here as two Cyclones trying to target down the one. This one's already almost dead. And things are going to be pretty rough here for Teardrop as these Cyclones are establishing position here in the natural. The Reaper's helping out as well. Pushing all the army units back. This SCV gets left for dead. More SCVs going down. And yeah, this base is going to have to lift up. So very successful initial attack here for Axis. And this base is not going to be able to mine for quite a bit. Now this Siege Shank is in a great position. And essentially means that Teardrop's probably not going to lose the game right now to this attack. But still, now that this base is building, all Axis has to do is just maintain position here. <clears throat> for at least a little while. And start mining off two bases to get an edge. Picking off these supply depots is very helpful as well. He probably doesn't want to lose this army. So he's going to be careful with it here. The tank's going to move up. Again, smart decision. Very well played from Axis. And, I mean, despite <clears throat> the build order uh, difficulties that Teardrop is having here, he's responded fairly well, I guess. But he did still lose 8 SCVs. And he's now heavily behind in SCVs. And Axis has got the second base up and already half mining. And he's continuing to macro from here, whereas uh, it's emergency mode here for Teardrop. Vikings will be helpful, though, in the defense. At this point, 
you know, this army has already done its job. It, it could continue to do its job a little bit longer. But it's going to get forced out here soon enough. Trying to get out. Oh. One cyclone does go down. But, like I said, mission successful as far as I'm concerned. He's got a heavy lead now. He's up to 40 workers. Uh, he's hasn't lost anything. So, he's doing pretty good over here. Looking like he's going into a second factory as well. With a couple of ravens. I mean, we're going to be seeing some pretty heavy mech here coming out of Axis. Um, and on the other side, we got Stim coming in. So, bio play from Teardrop. But he's going to be playing from behind. It's going to be an uphill battle for sure. Even more Ravens coming out for Axis as well. I know the Ravens have been changed around a little bit. But I haven't really seen too many games where the Ravens are heavily featured. So, looking forward to see what they can do. Third base going down. <clears throat> At this point, he can easily defend that. I do like this move by Teardrop. Just sending out random marines and vikings to get vision if he wants to spot an attack coming then he'll be able to potentially but he's moving out here and i suppose he kind of has to like he needs to get some sort of damage done especially with the third base being uh placed down already by axis but it looks like these armies might pass each other or they might meet in the middle of the field Axis sets to something. I think he scanned. Yeah, he sees no army, so he's heading on back. Playing defensive. And he's going to try to crush this attack. And he's in a pretty good position to be able to do it. Now, these siege tanks could get a lot of damage done if they siege up in, in the right spot. But the Ravens are there to help against that. And this was very good timing. Knocking down the, the rocks here. There's going to be pretty much nothing for a teardrop. He's going to be able to hammer at these buildings a little bit. And that's going to be pretty annoying for now. But it's not as much damage as he needs. He needs much more. Cyclones are up and in position now. Smart move by Teardrop to move out of the way, though. Does he have a third base? He does have a third base made. Morphing into a orbital. So he's trying to do the right things to catch back up here, but it's going to be difficult. This third base is already done. He's already got the gases mining. I think that's two, by the way. <clears throat> this is a lot of Hellions. They're going to be able to run by extremely simple if they want. I don't know if he's going to consider it. Well, he's got the Cyclones with him as well. So it looks like he's actually just going to plan on just attacking into this defense. The Siege Tanks are not even sieged. So this is not going to go well for Teardrop. He does try to siege up eventually. But Disruption... Is that the name of that ability? The Ravens are essentially rendering those Siege Tanks useless. And Axis is moving up into the map. There's an attack going over here on the third base. He's actually going to be able to get that third base. And it's somewhat scary over here. But GG. Yeah, I mean, I think it was pretty clear here that uh, Axis was in the better position. He was mining off of a third base for, well, at all. I mean, this guy barely even started. So, nice uh, game one here coming out of Axis, the pink Terran player. And that's going to be a one nothing lead for him in this best of three. As we get ready to move into the second game. Yeah, it was a pretty good game. Read the situation well. Yeah, you're pink. I won't make that mistake again. The really weird thing, though, is that it still looks like teal to me. Like, even right now, when I'm seeing your name in pink, beside the StarCraft II normal text, it, <laughs> it looks very similar to me. So I, I don't know. It's, I'm having a problem with that. So here we go. 
Game number two, this could potentially be the final game of the day. So let's go ahead and jump into it. On Acid Plant, it is the Yellow Terran player, currently down 1-0, representing Team UR. It is Teardrop. And in the top left corner, having a pretty successful game one, representing Lit, it is Axis. The pink Terran player. So, <clears throat> I am wondering myself whether or not Teardrop is going to change up his style here. Because he, yeah, and already he is. He's going into a gas first here. Same thing that Axis is doing. He's going to be playing a lot more defensively this time, I think. Understanding that Axis is not afraid to throw a lot at him early on in order to gain that edge. Now they're both going to throw shit at each other. And we'll have to see. Could be a micro battle. Could be just uh, another sort of, you know, build order battle again. See how it goes. As far as second gases go, once again, though, Axe has taken that one much quicker. So a very big indication that he wants to be getting out expensive units. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> StarCraft 2, in general, is just throwing shit at each other. I'd say it's more about TVT being that way than StarCraft 2 in general. Maybe ZVZ as well. Uh, and even in PvP you could do it. So more in, like, mirror matchups, I guess. Even in non-mirror matchups you can find yourselves in these situations. But for me specifically, I just think TVT plays out this way a little bit more than most others because if you take an early expansion then you're just in trouble at least that's my perception of it uh teardrop does scv scout he's gonna see the two gas and he's gonna understand that once again even though he is dropping the uh the second base here early he's gonna be in the defensive position he's got our reaper heading out as well and there's a reaper coming in here from axis and I like Teardrop's decision to keep the SDV with the Reaper in case he did have to fight against uh, Axis's Reaper, but they ended up passing each other, so not going to matter too much. He might be able to delay this expansion. And he absolutely will be able to delay that expansion, and he might be able to get into the base or kill another SDV, and he'll be able to do both of those things. On the other side here, this Reaper for Teardrop, has he managed to get any kills? He has one kill. And he might be able to get something else here. But the Cyclone is out. Oh, is he going to be able to get one more SCV kill? It's a little weird because there's like a, a micro battle going on on both sides of the map. This Reaper here has picked up five kills. There's nothing left in the base to defend against him. He's getting even more. And now Teardrop has to bring his Reaper back home. So overall... Wait... Did it get away or did it die? I think it died. Is it control L? I don't remember what the units lost. Oh, there it is. I don't know. I'm pretty sure that Reaper died. But overall, workers lost. 7-3. to three. Once again, Axis has the advantage. But the second base is up right now for Teardrop. And he has got it into orbital mode. So he's going to be double dropping mules and double producing SCVs. And this is going to be a good thing for him as long as he doesn't die to anything that comes his way. And there's another attack coming here. Two Cyclones and a Reaper. This Reaper is going to scatter the Cyclones and then die. And now there's two Cyclones versus one. This is not very good. This Cyclone is trying to run for his life. There's a bunker in position. This is going to help. And with SCVs repairing, I actually think that's enough to push this back. Axis doesn't want to lose that Reaper, but he will. Oh! There's more going on here. Hellions are getting intercepted by Cyclones. The bunker does go down, and the Cyclones stay alive. Once again, two Cyclones versus one. And a Banshee here, so... This is really rough for Teardrop. Now, the tank is in a good position, but the Banshee is going to be able to deal with that. It's all about, is Axis going to lose this Cyclone? Yes, he will. And now the Banshee's going to want to probably come in and try to get something done. He still drew the attention away from the main. 
Teardrop has no idea this Banshee's coming in, although now he does. So even more harassment coming from Axis. And this is essentially that same analogy, right? Like, Axis is throwing shit at Teardrop right now. He threw uh, two Reapers, he threw Cyclones, he threw a Banshee. Um, and he's doing damage with it. Even gonna be able to chip away at some of these Marines as well. No Cloak, though, but Cloak is on the way for a Teardrop, actually, as a Banshee for him goes on out. This Banshee is just wreaking havoc. Seven kills here. Probably can take out these Marines. The scan goes down, but the Banshee doesn't even have Cloak. A little bit of a misplay from... Uh... Ah, shit, every time I look away, something dies here from Axis. So I guess that Banshee did eventually go down. Nope, it didn't. It's over here. Picking off even more. Now the turret is going to go up. This Banshee has 15 kills. Oh my god. Okay. I'd say that Banshee paid for itself. 16 worker kills to 6 for Axis. His second base is up now. And uh, Banshee died over here for... Teardrop. So once again, Axis is basically on top of everything here. He's... Getting a lot of damage done with his early aggression and defending the counter aggression from Teardrop. And Teardrop has got to be feeling pretty sad here. The worker count is even, but the army supply is much bigger in favor of Axis. Although I do like this move by Teardrop getting the third base. He knows, well at least he may know that he's going to have to catch up in one aspect of this game. And he he's clearly showing to be like the wanting to get to late game or at least mid game type macro player where Axis has been very aggressive, putting together different types of attacks, attacking from different angles with Banshees and Cyclones and Reapers, um, and then later Ravens. And the, I like the addition of Ravens, because when you're a Terran player and you're on the defensive, what do you usually make? Siege tanks. And we probably see that happening over here as well. Siege tanks being made by Teardrop to play defensive, because he knows he's trying to macro. But the Ravens come in and disrupt those tanks, and then... You know, all of a sudden, everything you spent all that mineral and gas on doesn't matter for the for the important fight. So I like this. And you can even see it here. It's like he knows that he needs to be defensive. He's putting his tanks into very specific positions in order to get the most out of uh, being able to defend. Third base going down in position for Axis, though, just like last game. Meanwhile, for Teardrop, his is in his own base. So, once again, Axis is going to be mining off that third base earlier. And he's attacking when he expands, which is a good thing. This way, he can force his opponent to be defensive. Meanwhile, everything is working itself out in the background. I like the idea of Liberators, but the Cyclones are going to be pretty good against that. Here comes the Ravens, looking for the Siege Shanks to disrupt. There's one, there's two. There's still a Siege Shank tucked in way back here, but it doesn't have a lot of range to be able to push this back. A couple Cyclones getting hit, but not as many that need to be. One more tank up here, though, still able to rain hell from above, and that actually does end up getting cleaned up. So, overall, I mean, that was actually a pretty impressive defense coming out of Teardrop. Considering I thought he was probably going to die there, the disruption from the Ravens didn't last long enough, and this tank, the hero, he's got five kills, he was able to push all that back. But, like I said before, because Axis expanded while he attacked, even though he lost his entire army, he still put the pressure on his opponent, so now everything was happening on that side of the map. Meanwhile, he's got this third base that's almost fully up and running. And Teardrop does not yet. He's still in his own main with his third. We know he wants to take it soon, but even though Axe has lost his army, he still has the advantage here, and he's going to be able to rebuild that stuff. And I bet you he's making... Uh, I mean, I probably should have picked up on this much earlier, but there are four factories now. Uh, so we're definitely going to be seeing a bunch more mech here. Very similar to last game. The upgrades are coming in as well. So I'm liking that. The supply is starting to uh, build here for Axis as well in his favor. 
He's got the worker lead. The worker lead is going to continue to grow the longer this expansion is not working. So things are looking pretty good here. And what does Teardrop need to do in order to come back in this game? He's playing Bio. He's got the ability to drop all over the place. This base here is actually pretty susceptible to, to drops right now. But he's got to be very careful. He basically doesn't want to engage this army head on. He wants to pick Axis apart. With Blue Flame on these Hellions now, they're going to be very good against those Marines and those SCVs. And this third base is being evacuated already. Barely even had time to mine. Some of these SCVs are lining up here. A bunch of them going down. Even if all the Italians die, which they do very nifty play here. Though picking up like eight SCVs or six SCVs and saving them. Very, very nice. But still, the attack in general for uh, Axis got a lot of damage done. Oh, a full medevac goes down to these Vikings. Man... If you're teardrop now, you're just not very happy. Everything is going against you. And nothing is working. You finally get your third and then like eight blue flame hellions run in and just chase everything away. You try to drop, which is supposed to be your advantage. And it gets picked off over here on this side of the map. And now Axis has this incredibly scary army. And it's on the warpath here trying to move across the map. And this third base is going to have a very hard time staying alive here as the rocks are going down. This T-Shang needs to siege up. It's too late. T-Shang goes down. Third base gets evacuated once again and shoot away. Meanwhile, fourth base going down for Axis. I like this hidden base for Teardrop. Neat idea to try to catch back up. <coughs> Excuse me, but losing the third though, I mean even with the, oh, oh, look at this, didn't even notice, he's building bases all over the place. He's basically taking the Zerg solution and seeing if it'll work. Unfortunately for him, it doesn't look like it's going through. There are so many tanks here just choking Teardrop out of every position that he wants, and now when the Cyclones and, and Vikings and... Hellions move in. They're going to have so much position to work with here. Get a lot done. Meanwhile, another army being built back at home. Bunkers going down. Oh, that, that medevac almost goes down here to the Vikings. And it looks like Teardrop might try to move across and get a little damage done. Maybe? I don't know. Axis repositioning here. This base is not going to be allowed to remain... The interesting thing about this idea, though, is that it's working a little bit. Building bases everywhere means that there's going to be some places that your opponent won't find you. But it's a pretty heavy investment. It's not very cost-efficient for obvious reasons. Some action going down on sort of all angles here, this part of the map. The tanks are reigning supreme. Axis is moving back. He wants to defend his fourth a little bit, combined with his army up here. Little skirmishes here and there. This Hellion is going to get taken out by a Marauder. And some of these bases, like I said, have survived. So they're actually going to be working out at least a little bit. But the worker count is still heavily in favor of Axis here. He's almost at 70 SDBs. Almost 20 ad. He's ready to move out with another attack. This time he's going to bring some Liberators along. These Vikings are doing their best, but they're not going to stand a chance. These siege tanks are doing their best as well. There's a lot of air units here for Teardrop, and this is going to be a huge engagement here. Hellions running rampant everywhere. It looks like the air control is there, though, for Teardrop. So he might be able to actually push this back, strangely enough. Oh, man, if only these Hellions... Oh, there. there's an opportunity there. These Cyclones are doing a good job. Yeah, here we go. A bunch of SCVs is going to be going down to these Hellions and Siege Tanks. And, I mean, it was fairly impressive for Teardrop to defend against that. But he still lost a ton. He's still very far behind. He lost even more workers now. It's 58 workers killed for Axis. 
And at this point, he's just moving back. He has to know that he's got an incredible advantage in this game, and he can basically do whatever he wants. So now he's making Thors. Three at a time. And he just has to not die. He's got uh, Mr. Turrets up around to defend against those drops that might have been able to do some damage before. And it looks like he's uh, thinking he wants to move out here. He's almost maxed out. The Thors are not quite with the team. But he doesn't really need them. Oh my god. Even Hellions against the Sea Shanks are just wrecking everything. There's going to be a lot of Sea Shanks that die here. A lot of Sea Shanks are going to die. But he had a lot more Sea Shanks. Unfortunately for these Hellions, there's just really not a lot left for them to kill. They're not particularly good against buildings, even with Blue Flame. But he's being annoying with them anyway. Is he gonna kill these? Nah, he should lose that fight. Yeah. But now he's got Thors, though. And he can make even more Thors. I think there's just a couple of these bases that he doesn't know about. Yeah, he doesn't know about either of them that are out here, so that's the only reason why he's not won the game yet, basically. Scan's going down. Teardrop has to know where he stands in this game. But he still has a pretty strong air army, which is where the Thors are going to come in. The Thors are going to just tear this apart. And then the game will be over. Here we go. Axe is getting ready for his final push. Moving into the natural. There's nothing here except for Liberators and Vikings. And the Thors are just firing away. There's one close Banshee here that's doing some damage. But that's all she wrote. GG from Teardrop. And that's going to do it for Axis. Anyone else notice that StarCraft is just being kind of weird? Like... This victory screen seems like it ends kind of abruptly. I don't know, man. Maybe it's just me. But either way, that is going to do it. So Team Unrivaled is going to take Week 1 versus Lit. Unfortunately, we're going to go down and start the Season 0-1. It was very close. There was a few walkovers. Um, and actually, you are even gifted us two walkovers. And we gifted them one. Um, and we still ended up taking the L. But at least our ace match went our way. Axis played very well and essentially dominated. I mean, I feel like I was sort of talking him up quite a bit during that game, but uh, during both games maybe even. But the thing is, if you look at that game and you just see what's going on, it just looked like he, he always had the right answers and he just always had the lead. So it was essentially a dominating performance in a losing effort from Lit. Uh, but we take what we can get, right, when we lose those weeks. So let's uh, get on out of here. And let's just do this just to finalize it. There we go. Export. And that's going to do it. So guys, I hope to do this every... Well, I, hold on. I was going to say every Monday, uh, starting at 1 p.m. Next week on Monday, it's going to be at 1 p.m. again. But after that, things might change a little bit, just depending on my work schedule. Um... But it'll, it'll be on Monday, and it'll be as close to 1 p.m. as possible, essentially. Uh, that's the plan going forward. Hope you guys enjoyed the cast. Thank you very much for the follows and for stopping by and watching it with us. And uh, thank you to the players for playing their games and getting those replays in so I can cast them. I will see you guys next Monday for more StarCraft II casting. As for tomorrow, I'm going to be back again at 1 p.m. I'm going to be casting myself playing StarCraft II. I'm a Diamond Zerg player. I'm not very good. But I'm going to try to get better. As I'm casting, uh, I'm going to play as well so that I can try to get a little better. So that's tomorrow from 1 to 4. And uh, I'm streaming every day something. But that's the immediate news. Anyway, thanks again, guys. And we will see you next time.